Hello, everybody. My name is Ronald Paredes, and welcome to our part two of our webinar series. The first part uh, basically involves a description of the basic components that are involved in a battery-based uh, renewable energy system. And part two will go into uh, the description of the sizing considerations that we need to look at as we're sizing each component. And we are going to begin with the load profile. And we're going to work our way down, all the way down to the batteries. So um, I have um, a uh, profile here for solar installation that I looked at uh, some time ago. And, and really all that I, the only reason I have that here is because it follows the pattern that we want to see in a solar system, which is, um, uh, which is basically that when you have a lot of energy being used uh, from the batteries, the same amount of energy or more should go into the batteries. So the amount of production that is allowed to go into the batteries should be proportional. So in other words, if we have 100 hours, 100 amp hours consumed out of the batteries, we should have 110, 115 amp hours going into the batteries. And if the batteries are not being used, if they're just on float, then uh, very little amp hours uh, should go into the batteries. Really only uh, the amp hours accumulated from the float, uh, from the float charging should go into the batteries. And so here, uh, here we have the pink shows the current coming in. Uh, the blue is the discharge current. So we see that here at the beginning of the chart where lots of current is being taken out of the batteries, that is followed by a lot of current going into the batteries. And towards the end of the test here where we see very little current, um, discharge current out of the batteries, uh, we also see very little current, uh, if any, going into the batteries. So. Uh, that's the pattern that we want to see, and that's really the goal that we want to that we want to go for. So, the first step in sizing a system is, of course, the load profile, and this is going to be the bulk of the work because customers often don't know what their loads are. Um, but it's, it, this is going to be uh, a key point in in the design process, and we really need to know what the amp hours are, what kilowatt hours uh, that are going to be consumed, and look at the loads, are they going to be, is it something that's going to be turning on and off randomly, is it cyclical, uh, is the load going to coincide with other loads? Uh, in other words, what is the likelihood that several loads uh, will be on at the same time? And the reason we want to know that is because we want to know exactly what power is coming out of the batteries. So one of the things that makes uh, system sizing difficult is that we're dealing with both energy and power, uh, and we'll go. We'll talk more about that as as we move through. Um, station, but just keep that in mind for now. Uh, the other thing we want to account for, and this is another big point, is the uh, system inefficiencies. Every time we go through a conversion step, we experience a loss, and so that loss. In, in in efficiencies, we need to account for that. And so, to give an example, um, our FS inverters have a nominal weighted efficiency of about 90%. So we'll need to take that into account. Our charge controllers um, also have a nominal efficiency of 97.5%. Um, but those are not the only losses. There are also we also see losses through the wiring uh, from say the um, the, the batteries to the inverter or from the charge controller to the batteries and we'll need to account for those as well. Um, something, uh, other factors that we'll need to know about the system is uh, the uh, demand factor, uh, the diversity factor, how critical the system will be. Um, all those things are going to go into account and I'll just leave that up to you to, to determine. We'll briefly talk about them but just uh, those are factors that will need to uh, will also need to be considered. The other um, um, uh, type of load that can can be uh, um, overlooked easily is um, 
the inverse current that some loads are going to have. The classical load that has a big inverse current is, of course, uh, pumps and, and, and inductive loads like motors, for example. So we really need to know, we really need to determine and, and quantify what that transient uh, current is going to be because all of that is going to be it's going to be coming out of the batteries and we'll need to account for that when we are essentially sizing the system to recharge the batteries. Running currents are also important. Uh, again, we need to know which loads are going to be on and that's going to lead us nicely into what the running current is going to be. So we really need to ask ourselves from an energy standpoint, what is the load that the battery is seeing? And it's going to see uh, essentially three losses, and now we'll get more into that right now. But here are two graphs of two different uh, load profiles. And the reason I like this is because they really show uh, how a load profile is going to look. Here at the bottom right hand, we have basically a motor. Uh, and I want, there's three things that we need to look at here. There, there is the, um, the peak, uh, the inverse current. There is the running current. And then there is the parasitic current. Please note that it doesn't quite go down to zero. There's always some load on the battery here. Um, the running current uh, is about 6 amps, but the starting current, the inverse current, is about 15 amps. And although it, it's not the period of the of the inverse current is very small, it's still energy that's coming out of the battery. Here in the left-hand corner here, on the upper left-hand corner, we see a load profile that is taking into account how the different loads of the system are interrelated. So here, what, what we're, the goal here is to see, for example, there might be um, a pump and a blender coming on at the same time, for example. And so that current is going to be very, very high. And we'll need to know what that is uh, in order to size the battery bank appropriately and also in order to just, in order to look at the discharge current because that's going to tell us uh, which capacity we need to use for the batteries, either the 20 hour the five hour, 100 hour rate, or the functional hour rate that we'll be talking about in a bit later. Here's the system block diagram. We saw this uh, uh, block diagram in, our part, in part one of the webinar, but I just have this here just to show uh, how the current or the power is going to flow PV array through the, uh, to the charge controller uh, battery bank. Please note that the battery bank is not in between the charge controller and the inverter is actually paralleled. And it's actually the central node between the charge controller and the inverter. So key to know that. And then we have the inverter, and then we also have the grid or the, the uh, distribution panel. But also the other components that we need to look at here is the wiring between the PV and the charge controller, the wiring between the charge controller and the battery, wiring between the battery bank and the inverter, and wiring between the inverter and the um, distribution uh, between the load. Here is um, uh, a slide that shows the system inefficiencies here. So here we have essentially eight efficiencies that we need to look at, beginning with the uh, inverters and distribution wiring. It's uh, critical to note that we are going to be losing some voltage between the inverter and the, the load. Also, it's key to note that we have a nominal efficiency of 92%. And also that the batteries, the wiring from the batteries to the, to the inverter will also experience a, low, uh, a loss. Um, I have a, a nominal uh, efficiency here of 98%, but I've seen applications where it's uh, less than 1%. And I've also seen applications where the uh, the batteries and, and, the, and, and uh, the distance between the batteries and the inverter is very, very long, or that the distance between the inverter and the loads can be hundreds of feet long. And so it's critical to know what that load is going to be, what that loss is going to be, because that's going to enable us to know what the load on the batteries will be. Then we have the efficiency of the batteries, and then the efficiency 
the, uh, the, the voltage loss or the, the, the efficiency loss between the uh, charge controller uh, and the batteries. Uh, the wiring is what's, what we're looking at there. And then we also have the, um, the efficiency of the charge controller. Um, and so the, the, the sense that I want you to get here is that this is not 100% uh, efficient. No system is 100% efficient. And uh, here we see that, for example, the efficiency between um, the batteries and the AC loads, for example, is about 86%. And here we see that the efficiency between uh, the batteries and a DC load, for example, if we didn't have any AC loads, is about 82%. And the big difference here is that in the case of the, the inverter, we have an efficiency of 92%. And in the case of the DC to DC converter here, we have 88%. Uh, lower efficiency here will basically mean um, about four points uh, less. So important to know that. Now, however you calculate what the loads are going to be, we really need to uh, uh, the wattage, the runtime, and another uh, key um, column to have is the time of use that's going to tell us which loads are going to be on or running at the same time. Um, if the appliance or the load doesn't have the watts and only has the volts and the amps, then we would simply use the power factor. I just mentioned that there are there's really two types of power factors that we need to look at. There's a displacement power factor and a distortion power factor. Um, displacement power factor is what uh, what we'll be dealing with the most, and uh, distortion is really nonlinear loads, but uh, both will basically reduce the power factor, and so we need to know what that is so that we can size the inverter uh, um, appropriately here. The DC loads, uh, the same thing. We need to know how, what the watts are, how many of those loads are, and also the DC load voltage. Now, uh, uh, an important thing here to note is that it's best to use a DC to DC converter. Uh, say, for example, if we had a, a 48 volt uh, battery system and we had a load of 24 volts, the last thing we'd want to use, we'd want to do is to tap into two uh, of uh, two 12 volt batteries to have our 24 volts and then from there go, go, go to the load because that's going to lead into uneven discharging of the batteries. And so when we, um, when we go back and uh, recharge those batteries, we're not going to charge those batteries evenly. And so it's best to just use a DC to DC converter to go from 48 volts to 24 volts, uh, uh, which will basically be a step down or, or a buck converter. And then from that point on, um, that's going to basically ensure that we're discharging the entire battery back and not just a few of the batteries. After that, we want to add the AC and the DC, and then uh, this will give us a sense for what the total uh, load is going to be on the system, and uh, we basically go from there. But, um, it, and this is just a, a sample. I will have an, a spreadsheet that's going to enable you to do this automatically. Uh, but this is just for you to get a sense of the things that we need to consider when we're doing the load profile, which is um, probably 70% of the work. Uh, the data collection, data gathering, and it can be a little frustrating at times from in getting trying to get that information from customers. I would really encourage you to go look at the nameplate of some of the critical loads. Uh, if, if, for example, there's a pump, um, it's going to be very important to look at the nameplate of that of that motor uh, to have an accurate picture of uh, what the real load is going to be. On to charge controllers. So in, in charge controllers, you really need to look at a few things. But uh, the critical thing that we need to look at is that the higher the input voltage, um, the lower the efficiency. So I know that sounds a little counterintuitive, but if we follow this curve here, uh, this testing was done for a 48 volt uh, system. And here we see that at 100 volts, our efficiency is roughly 95.7. Um, 
and at 85 it increases to about 97 and at um, 68 it increases to about 98.1 and so we see here that the closer we are to the nominal nominal voltage the, hot, the, the, the more efficient the system is going to be now um, that said uh, this isn't going we're not going to size a system with these parameters in mind we need to size a system in a way that we make sure that the open circuit voltage uh, of, of the PV array never exceeds the 150 volt limitation that we talked about in part one, um, and, and, and that it doesn't exceed it at the lowest expected temperature. And also that we are able to charge the batteries, because remember that at the end of the day, uh, the controller is essentially a DC to DC converter. So we have here, just to remind us, we have here a thousand watts. If we have a thousand watts coming into the charge controller, and 975, uh, 975 watts at the output, that gives us basically 59 volts and 16.5 amps. And we have this here again. It's uh, just for emphasizing this, this uh, uh, the sizes of the arrays for 12 volts, a uh, thousand watts for 24. 2,000 and for 48 volts, uh, 4,000 watts. It's important to follow these uh, recommendations so that we don't have or we don't experience uh, tripping of the um, 80 amp up output breaker. In terms of the uh, short circuit current, the uh, charge controller has to be able to handle 125 percent of the total of the arrays uh, ISC, uh, the short circuit current. So what that basically means is that because we have an ADM controller, it means that our short circuit current is limited to 64 amps. And so, however, uh, this is uh, although important because we have an MPPT charge controller and because it's such a high current, it's, 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 it won't be, it's typically not a, a, an issue. So some, some guidelines to size the charge controller, first and foremost, uh, is following this table here. The second is we are going to look at the voltages so that we don't exceed the maximum input voltage of the charge controller and also so that we're able to charge the batteries at the worst possible conditions, meaning when the amping temperature when, when we're at the highest expected temperature, if we need to equalize the batteries, for example, which would be the highest charging voltage. So if we were charging a um, 48 volt system, the typical uh, EQ voltage will be 62 volts, and so our system needs to be higher than that. Um, our system voltage, the PV array voltage, will need to be higher than that. Um, so going to that, uh, I chose the uh, 240, uh, 240 watt module from Trina, and here we have uh, all the parameters that we want to look at that we'll be needing to uh, that we'll need to use for our calculations. And here are the temperature ratings here at the bottom. Um, so for the maximum uh, voltage, um, there's two ways to calculate this. We can either look at uh, table 690.7, which if we happen to be using the right technology, we can basically just apply this table and go down, go down this column uh, for the ambient temperature. Uh, and there we'll find the factor, a multiplying factor, and so we basically just multiply that factor by the VOC, and that gives us uh, what the expected, uh, what that VOC, the open circuit voltage, will be at the lowest expected temperature. The other way is to use this temperature data here, uh, and we basically just go through, through these uh, calculations, but the one thing I want you to notice here is that if the lowest expected temperature is uh, minus 2C and our open circuit voltage is 37.2 at 25, uh, at 25C, our open circuit voltage at 2C will go from 37.2 to 40.7 volts. 
So there is quite an increase there. Uh, now, it's it's important to, to keep in mind that the limitation here is the 150 volts, and so we now we want to essentially divide the 150 by the 40.7, which gives us uh, 3.68 um, uh, modules in each uh, string. Uh, and so with that limitation, so our 40.7 volts times 3 will be 122.1 volts, is going to be uh, the open circuit voltage at the lowest expected temperature. So we're not exceeding the 150, so we're OK there. Next, we need to make sure that we charge the batteries. And again, if we are dealing with a 48 volt system, uh, we can see that the VMP, uh, the voltage at the maximum power point is uh, 30.4. 30 and once we apply the temperature coefficients, we see that at 35 that voltage will go from 30.4 to 24.6. So 24.6 times 3, because we're going to wire three modules in each string from our pre previous uh, slide, uh, turns out to be 73.8, which is higher than, roughly 12 volts higher than our uh, EQ voltage, our equalizing voltage, so we're OK there. So what we've done is we have essentially, um, we've We've calculated that we're not going to exceed the maximum input voltage of 150, and that, uh, and this is at the high, at the lowest expected temperature, and that we're also not going to, ex uh, we're, and at the and at the highest expected temperature, that we are going to be able to charge the batteries. So we've looked at. Uh, the worst possible conditions for the lowest and the highest uh, expected temperature. So now we go to our array uh, um, IMP, the, uh, the current at the, at the maximum uh, power point. So if we, if we have um, 4,000 watts and we're wiring uh, three of these uh, in series, uh, basically that means that we're going to have a current of 43.9. And from here, we can calculate how many strings we can have. Um, which turns out to be 5.5 strings. Now, two things. We can, we can either go to six strings, or we can go to five strings. Now, keeping in mind that we have this 64 amp limitation uh, of a short circuit current, um, so if we multiply the, uh, um, the current times 5 and times 1.25, for five strings, that turns out to be 52.3 amps. And for six strings, that turns out to be uh, 62 amps. So we're, we're not going to exceed uh, the short circuit requirements if we go to five or uh, six uh, strings. So we're OK there. Now, um, for five strings, um, here are the, the calculations, basically. So going through this table here, we see that we have a maximum input for a 48 volt system of 4,000 watts. Our max input voltage will be 122 volts. Our main input voltage will be roughly 91. And we said that we are going to have three modules in each uh, string. Now, this is basically a 3,600 watt uh, system. And so to turn current, the current at the output of the controller and just just dealing with dominoes and, and, and not taking um, and just taking the practical approach here, all we're going to do is multiply the wattage, rather divide the wattage by the voltage. And so 3,600 watts divided by the efficiency, which is uh, 97.5. And uh, if we divide, I'm sorry, 3,600 watts times 97.5, 5% divided by 48 gives us uh, 73.1 amps. Now, uh, the FM80, for example, has an 80 amp breaker. So we're not exceeding the 80 amps. So we're OK there. We're not going to experience uh, tripping of that 80 amp breaker. This is for five strings. Now, if we were tempted to go to six strings, then we go through the same calculations. Um, uh, 4,320 watts times our efficiency and dividing that by 48 volts turns out to be 87.7 87, uh, amps, which clearly exceeds our 80 amp breaker and will be exceeding, will be experiencing some tripping there. So 
And we started with this because the calculation said that we could have 5.5 strings. And so the goal is to, of course, putting as many modules uh, in each charge controller, but also that we don't experience uh, tripping of that ADM breaker, that we don't overload uh, the output of the uh, charge controller um, uh, to charge the batteries. The other thing that's important to take into account as we're citing charge controllers is that they do derate the output um, as a function of temperature. So at, uh, uh, remember we said in part one that these uh, charge controllers will put out the ADMs at a nominal temperature of 40 degrees C. And so once the temperature begins to increase beyond the 40 C, then the charge controller will derate uh, at a rate of 1% per degree. Uh, so if we were sitting at 50 uh, degrees C, what that means is the charge controller is basically sitting at 98% output because of the 1% uh, per degree uh, derating. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Uh, we will often exceed, we, will, we might see a 55 a C, and so at that point, the, the charge controller will only be at um, basically an 85% output. So we would go back to our calculations and take that into account so that we don't exceed uh, essentially the opacity uh, of the charge controller. On to inverters. So for the inverter, here we need to uh, remind ourselves again of these uh, um, efficiencies or inefficiencies. Uh, and this here, this is the, the weighted uh, CEC efficiency, which is, of course, available um, at their website, uh, California Energy Commission. Uh, you can download a number of uh, efficiency curves there, but I just have it there for your reference. Uh, and just, I only have it there so that you can see that efficiency is not a flat curve, that it does vary with um, essentially the loading of, of the inverter. So uh, we don't want to, uh, we want to size the inverter in a way that we to exceed uh, the rating of the, of the inverter, that the inverter will be able to handle the continuous loads, but also the transient loads like a motor, for example, but also we don't go so high uh, that we undersize completely, uh, um, that we oversize rather the, the inverter because then our efficiencies are going to drop. Um, and so it's just important to, to keep that in mind. Uh, just reminding us that in part one we saw this uh, eight uh, diagram and we saw that our pass through current meaning the current that flows through switch one. Um, this path here is often 60 amps, uh, but that the export current coming from the batteries or from the renewable source is um, and then on the rating of uh, the inverter. So for example, if we were dealing with a VFX uh, 36 48, for example, which is uh, 3,600 VAs at 48 volts with a 48 volt input, basically we would just divide the 36, uh, the, the 3.6 kVA by 120, and that will give us uh, 30 amps. And so our export current, 30 amps, but our pass-through current will be 60 amps. So we'll keep that in mind as we start the uh, inverter. So uh, the first step is, of course, to choose the right model. We have uh, sealed and vented units, uh, and in the for the case of backup or standalone uh, inverters, and, uh, sealed and vented uh, inverters in the case uh, of a grid interactive uh, applications. Um, as you might imagine, the vented units tend to have the most power because uh, they're vented and they can dissipate the heat, they can get rid of the heat much easier, much more easier, and much more efficiently than a sealed unit, for example. But um, the key thing here will be to look at the load that the inverter is going to be seeing. So in each step, we need to ask ourselves, if I was an inverter, 
what load would I be looking at? So basically that means that you'll be, the inverter has to cope with the loads that are on continuously. And if uh, more loads happen to come on, the inverter will have to continue uh, to power those loads. And let's say, for example, that a pump wants to turn on or a big motor comes on, then the inverter has to cope with uh, the loads that it already has, plus what's coming online as well. So um, the first step that we'll, we'll be looking at here, uh, I just want to show this table here, because that what we've been talking about. So if, if we were, for example, looking at the VFX uh, um, 3524, just to say a model here, uh, we see that our input current, the max input current is 60 amps. The export current is 3,500 divided by 120. Um, so important to note that. Um, and looking at the load profile, uh, we need to look at essentially the continuous loads. Now, two things here. The inverter will happily invert from DC to AC all day long. Um, and it doesn't care uh, really where the where the DC is coming from. So you can have uh, a battery bank the size of like a six volt golf battery, or you can have a battery bank the size um, of a car. And the inverter will basically just continue uh, inverting until it reaches uh, the battery, the low battery cutout voltage. I mean, at that point, it'll just stop inverting. So uh, with inverters, we deal with power, uh, and with batteries, we deal in energy. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, again, we need to make sure that we uh, deal with uh, running currents, but also with transient inrush currents. Um, and the classical load that has that exhibits a, uh, that has an inrush current is, of course, the motor, and, and uh, uh, in way of the uh, what is called the uh, the locked rotor amps. Motors have um, full load amps, but they also have um, locked rotor amps, which is basically the current that a motor requires as, uh, when it's stopped and you apply power to it. And it's very, very high and really depends on here. But here's a table from the NEC, from the National um, Electrical Code, that essentially looks at the code letter. And the code, you can get a code letter from the nameplate of the motor. Uh, and with that, we can calculate the, uh, the inverse current. Uh, so here's our nameplate um, of a motor. Um, uh, we'll get into the nameplate. But I just briefly want to mention that the power factor is also very, very important. Uh, we rate the inverters in volt amps, as I'm sure some of you noticed to get away from power factors. So we put out the 30, in the case of a, a VFX uh, 30, 3648, um, we put out the 33.6 kVA independent of the power factor. So the power factor could end up actually being very low, uh, but we still put out the uh, 3.6 kVA. So here, Obviously, we want to make sure that we increase the power factors so that we can actually do our true work uh, in watts as, as much as possible, ideally uh, with a power factor of one. But So here is our nameplate. Uh, so this is a typical motor. So uh, three data points here. Here we have uh, the, the FL, the full load amps, when the motor is essentially running on um, it's reached its um, steady state current. Uh, this is a dual voltage motor. So if you, we can see here that it's a 115 uh, slash 230 volt amp motor. So 115 we draw 12 amps. Uh, and the uh, the KVA code, the uh, kilovolt amp code or the rotor code that we, uh, that we were talking about is uh, K in this case. So this is a uh, basically a one horsepower motor, single phase one horsepower motor. And so now we need to calculate what the inverse current, what the starting current is going to be. Uh, now the starting current can be 
as much uh, as little as three or so times uh, the full load apps, or it can be uh, as high as 12 times uh, the full load app, depending on the rotor code. It also depends on this depends on the mechanical load on that motor, meaning that if we had two five horsepower motors side by side and one had the, uh, a mechanical load attached to its shaft and the other one didn't, uh, they will experience very different uh, uh, locked rotor amps and running currents as well, and full load amps. So going through that and using the table uh, from uh, 437, we see that K gives us a range of 8 to 8.99. So now what we need to do to calculate the, uh, the inverse current, which is basically multiply that times the horsepower. So the log rotor amps equals horsepower times the KVA code divided by the voltage. So 1 times 8.99 times 1,000 to normalize it. Divided by 120 gives us 74.9 amps. So we went from 12 amps to 74.9 amps, um, or roughly 9,000 VAs. Now, it's important to know this because the inverter will have to handle the 9,000 VAs. And so, coming back here, I just want to point to a couple of things. Um, as far as the AC load, AC uh, overload capability, we have three different um, ratings here. We have the surge overload, the five second overload, and the 30 minute overload. Now the one the, the rating that we want to use is really the five second uh, because the surge rating is for very fast loads, uh, a load that is going to be less than 100 milliseconds. So that's about five cycles or so in that 60 hertz line. Um, so very, very fast, but uh, the five second uh, overload uh, rating is the, the one that we we'll want to use for uh, a load uh, locomotive, for example, because they tend to settle down in about five to 10 seconds. So it's going to be a more realistic uh, uh, um, rating to use. And the 30 minute rating that um, it's basically uh, an overload, an overload uh, situation, but it's not it shouldn't, inverters should not be sized for the 30 minute uh, uh, overload capability uh, in mind. The five second, because again, it's a temporary uh, load, but long term permanent loading should always be the nominal and, and not the nominal uh, rating and not the uh, 30 minute uh, rating. Here we have some temperature effects. Uh, the inverters, the FX inverters, are rated at 25C. And so, again, they have to be derated once the uh, temperature begins to climb beyond 25C. So if we were sitting at um, 35C, the inverter will be at 90%. Um, output because it, it has the same derating uh, as a function of temperature, uh, which is 1% per degree C, just like the charge controllers. So if we were sitting, for example, at 40 C, the inverter will now be at 85%. Now, the derating has to be done ideally manually so that the inverter never really gets um, overloaded uh, by mistake. So it's important to keep this in mind because in, in hot climates, uh, um, Arizona, uh, in, in those, those states in the southwest uh, uh, region of the country, the temperatures can be very, very high. And so it's important to note that we'll need to derate both the charge controller uh, and the inverters. And this is true for any uh, uh, electrical system as well. Unlike uh, batteries, they tend to do slightly better in, in hot climates. Um, and of course, uh, they have to be derated at colder climates. But uh, again, it's important to keep in mind that we need to take that into account. Now, battery sizing. 
The thing we need to note about batteries is that the load profile is very, very important. And again, we need to qualify the loads and we need to know what the average load uh, is going to be on those batteries. Uh, we really want to know what the average discharge current is going to be on those batteries because that's the current we're going to use on the batteries. And so it's, it's very important to use uh, the actual running current of the system uh, and not just based uh, uh, things on, on, on energy, on amp hours. So the last thing we'd want to use, we'd want to do, and the big mistake uh, is to basically calculate how many watt hours each load consumes uh, by basically just taking the product of the watts times the hours and after that converting to amp hours by using the voltage of the system. And so if you just do that and say, oh, I'm going to be consuming 200 amp hours uh, without taking uh, how discharge currents affect uh, batteries, then you are going to run into some, some issues down the line. Uh, in part one of this uh, webinar, we talked about how currents, discharge currents, will affect the batteries. And so very, very important to keep that in mind. Um, in the case, I'll briefly mention that in, in the case of our energy cell 200RE, it's a 200 amp hour battery, uh, but, it's, but it'll give us the 200 amp hours if we use a discharge current of 2 amps. Uh, if, for example, we had an average discharge current of 40 amps and the system is going to run, was going to run at 5 hours, which is also 200 amps, amp hours, uh, and we use the, uh, uh, the energy cells, the 200 RE batteries, then we'd run into some issues very, very soon because at, 40, with a, at a 40 amp, 40 amp discharge current, uh, the battery is going to have a very different capacity in terms of amp hours. So very key, very important to use the right hour amp hour rating, whether it's um, uh, either the, the five hour, three hour, or 100 hour, or the functional hour rate, which is what we'll be actually talking about. Um, we really want to make sure that we have a good idea of what that discharge current is going to be. Now, the other thing that's key in all of this is, of course, to use, to apply the right, uh, the right technology uh, in, in, in the system. We want to make sure that if, the, if, the, if, um, if it's a cycling application that we use a battery that is designed for cycling applications, and if it's a float slash backup type application, then we need to make sure that we use a battery that's meant for float applications. If it's going to be a hybrid, uh, application where it's going to be floating and then cycling and then floating again and then cycling again, then we need to ensure that we uh, apply a battery that has a combination of uh, cycling and floating um, characteristics. Now, that said, there are dual purpose batteries. Now, a dual purpose battery it is not a deep cycle battery. Uh, in fact, uh, most dual-purpose batteries, they, they also have a, a CCA, a cold cranking amps rating, because they're, they're dual-purpose in the sense that they, they are start both starting uh, uh, SLI batteries uh, and have some cycling abilities. So just a key, key, different, uh, key uh, um, different, uh, difference there. Um, We've seen this before, but again, just briefly mentioning that it's important to take into account the different losses, the different, the different um, um, discharge currents. Uh, let me uh, do this here. Let me skip ahead to one thing here. I'll come back to this slide, but I just want to uh, look at one thing. So if we have a load uh, of, say, um, 20 amps DC, um, which is not in any of these uh, ratings. So just we talked about this on uh, one of our webinar, but I'll just go through it briefly again. So here we see that see this, this column here is in hours, and this last column here is in amp hours. So here we have that the 100-hour rate is 200 amp hours. So if we divide uh, the 200 by 100, we get 2 amps of discharge current. 
In the case of the 20 amp hour rating, the 20 hour rating, uh, we see that the 20 hour rating gives us uh, 178 amp hours. Uh, so if we divide 178 by, by 20, we get 8.9 amps. Here we see that the five hour rate gives us, gives us uh, 145.5, which means that if 145.5 by 5 hours, it gives us uh, a little over 29 amps. Now, if if we don't, if, if our load doesn't match any of these ratings, then we need to apply what we call the capacity, or uh, rather a performance curve uh, that can be, um, or, or a pure curve as it's sometimes called, although this is not a pure curve, a real just a performance curve. But basically what we do here is we use the published ratings. And on the left side, you see the current. On the bottom side, on the, meaning on the, on the y-axis is the current in amps, the discharge current. And on the x-axis is the time in minutes. Now, these, most of these uh, axes here are uh, logarithmic, uh, base 10. So here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 amps up to 10. Then we have 10, 20, 30, 40 amps up to 100. Then 100, 2, 3, 4, 500 up to 1,000 um, amps. And on the x-axis, it's again the same thing, 10, 20, 30, all the way to 100 uh, minutes. And then 100, 200, 300 minutes. Then 1,000, 2,000. 3,000 all the way to 10,000 minutes. So here we use the, the, the published ratings. And what this allows us to do, essentially determine if, uh, how long a battery is going to run if we know what the discharge current is going to be. So if we had um, a discharge current of 20 amps, for example, we see that that's going to be roughly uh, 450 minutes of uh, runtime, and that's the, that's basically how you'd want to use uh, this chart. Now, um, you could get more accurate if you use the equation here. Um, if you wanted to really know, uh, really get very very detailed, but but again, the the main thing here is to know that. The higher the discharge current, the lower uh, the opacity, the capacity in amp hours uh, is going to be, just like our tables uh, showed uh, for the 200 RE battery. And so we don't want to use nominal um, ratings, like the 20 hour rating or the 100 hour rating, uh, unless the discharge current matches that rating. So what we do here, what we're using here, is the functional hour rate. We got away from the 5 hour, the 100 hour, or the 20 hour rate, and basically used those ratings to come up with this scale. Um, and this basically will, uh, this is going to essentially tell us what, what the actual, uh, uh, what the real running time is going to be uh, of the battery. We talked about, uh, uh, in, in part one of our webinar, that uh, batteries tend to give less capacity at, cold, at lower uh, climates. So we need to take that into account. We also need to take into account the days of autonomy. If someone wants, for example, two, three, four, five days of autonomy, uh, that will basically make the system, the battery bank, larger. For example, if someone wanted two days of autonomy, the battery bank has to be twice as big. The end of life capacity, or rather the end of life factor, is something that takes into account two things. The fact that batteries don't begin with the nominal capacity, meaning that if we had a battery that had 100 amp hour uh, rating, uh, that battery is not going to be 100 amp hours uh, when it's new. It's going to be about 80%. It'll deliver about 80, 80 amp hours when it's new. That's also the same number that it will deliver at the end of its life. And so it's important to take that into account so that we don't begin to, we don't have problems uh, either at the beginning of, um, 
uh, of the batteries and at the end of uh, the life of the batteries. The design margin, this is basically system growth. Um, you need to make sure that you ask your customers uh, for their estimate. For you know, the systems people continue, they will continue to buy appliances, and so the load on the system will grow. And uh, it could be as little as 10% growth through the life of the system, or it can be as much as 200%. Maybe they'll double their loads. So we need to take that into account. The DOD, the depth of discharge, we saw that the deeper we discharge the battery. Uh, the less cycles it's going to give us. And we saw uh, in part one that at 100% DOD, the battery is going to give us a little over 400 cycles, uh, uh, a cycle being uh, uh, discharged and a recharge. But at 10%, it'll give us uh, uh, well over 60,000 cycles. We really need to take that into account. Um, we need to, we'll be looking at two things. Uh, um, in, in our sizing exam, uh, exercise, uh, we can either control the DOD or we can have a system uh, sized such that the DOD, the maximum DOD, isn't controlled, it's not controlled. And so the batteries are going to be at 100% DOD through the, the autonomy period. That's one option. And the other option is going to be limiting the DOD to, let's say, 50% even at the end of the autonomy period. And so which route you go really determines uh, the size of the battery bank, of course, but also uh, how often uh, that uh, autonomy is going to be used. If you get the sense that uh, they will be using, uh, that the batteries are going to have to cope with the autonomy period very often, then we want to limit that DOD. But if it's not going to happen very often, then we don't have to worry about the DOD as much. And this goes back to how available the system is to be, uh, loss of load capabilities, uh, critical how critical the system is, and so forth. Um, next we have, and before I get to this point, I just want to point out that here we see that with 20 amps, we we are going to run um, 450, uh, 450 minutes. Now, this is the actual capacity that the battery is going to, under ideal lab conditions, deliver. Now, we still need to adjust, take into account these adjustment factors that we that we talked about: temperature, days of autonomy, end of life, design margin, DOD, and all of that basically goes into this equation here. Uh, this uh, simple equation here, we see that we multiply our unadjusted capacity in amp hours times our temperature adjustment, which is this table here. And the way you'd want to apply it is, for example, if the application happened to be at you know 14 degrees at the lowest uh, temperature for an AGM battery, we'd want to use 1.35, um, uh, the factor of 1.35. Then it whatever percentage uh, is going to, um, we're going to have there. Then we have the DOD. Uh, if we want to control the DOD, and that's it. That's going to give us the adjusted capacity uh, that the system is going to have to have. Um, this concludes the sizing. Um, now, all we've done is uh, discuss the factors that we need to consider when we're sizing a system. Uh, in part three, we're going to actually do an example, uh, a sizing example, and we're going to go in, uh, in more um, into more depth with our products and also with some of the special functions they can do, and really the advantages that a battery-based system provides over a, a simple grid-high battery-less system um, that doesn't really give you much, much options other than selling or uh, whatever solar you happen to be harvesting. So once again, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ronald Paredes, and I am uh, with the Applications Engineering Group.
Uh, I'm a senior applications engineer, and uh, we will be uh, uh, posting. We will already we will be posting all three webinars. Part one. This is part two, and part three as well. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day. Bye bye.